and we are going to slowly dissect this owl. Now this owl was an unfortunate uh, sort of uh, victim of a road accident, I think just outside the gate, which is obviously very sad, but provides us with an opportunity. It is a spotted eagle owl, and I'm just going to hold it up for you. He's a beautiful specimen. He is starting to smell a little bit rough at this stage. But just to give you an idea of his size, and the reason I'm using gloves, of course, is just so that, well, just so that I uh, don't get sort of muck on my hands. Now, if you are a sensitive viewer, I'm sorry about this, but it, I know it's a little bit disgusting. I find it quite macabre myself, but it's a really good opportunity to have a look closely at a bird like this or at a creature that we wouldn't normally get to examine in this sort of detail. So if you are a sensitive viewer, I'm sorry. I will warn you if I'm going to do anything foul. I'll do most of that while we're off air, and then I'll show you the bits and pieces that we find when you come back to me. So don't worry, you're not going to have to watch the entire surgical dissection of this hapless creature. But we need to do it before he becomes too stiff. Now you may ask yourself, why on earth does this owl have a left wing shorter than a right wing? And the answer would be because, well, Megan has already sampled some of his feathers, but that's okay. Look at this astounding, astounding appendage. Let me turn it so that it faces the light nicely. Now, it's often very difficult for me to picture how the wing feathers fall. And this is how they sit together. These are the primaries. And when the bird is flying, obviously they're airtight, they're completely airtight, and they slot into each other completely perfectly, like I've got it indicated there. And then, of course, the bird can open them up and allow air to go through them, which, of course, reduces lift. It allows, certainly, a bird like this to fly much more quietly and allows it, obviously, to slow down and then land. And then this magnificent appendage here allows the bird to make the most minor adjustments. It's called an aileron. Well, it's, that's what it's called on an aeroplane. And it allows the bird to make the most minor adjustments just to reduce or increase the drag over the top of the wing. Now, the next time you're in an aeroplane, if you've ever been in an aeroplane or if you're likely to go in one, try and get a seat in the middle of the plane, stick your head out and watch You'll see minor adjustments always. Normally, I think they're on the back of the aeroplane's wing, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but you'll see these minor adjustments going on all the time. And you'll just feel a very slight movement of the plane as it goes. And that's what this amazing appendage is for there. So we'll have a look at, well, a slight, slightly greater look at that, or a look at it in greater detail slightly later. And for now, I'm now going to cut it up, or start to cut it up, and while I do that, let's head across to Tristan, who has got a Polly, who wants a cracker. So nice to be back with you. Obviously, I'm not Miss McCurdy, am I? Right, the first thing I'm going to show you is what we often refer to, and I think is often almost impossible to imagine, and that is the cloacal opening. Now, if we look over there, that is the cloaca of this bird. Now, through that opening, it mates, it defecates, and urinates. So, everything comes out of that one opening. So, when a bird is mating, that opening will be closed against the other opening, whether it's male or female, and I do not know whether this bird is male or female, and I'm not sure I will be able to tell. No doubt somebody uh, a lot more competent at dissection, like a vet, for example, would be able to cut it open, and I'm sure we'd be able to see, and I will try and do this, I'll see, we'll be able to see the internal gonads inside the bird here, and so we should be able to find ovaries or what I suppose would qualify as bird testing just inside. So I'll chop that open and we'll have a look there. Now, I think that is really rather amazing. I've never seen that before. I've never, I've always wondered what it looked like and how it works, but there it is. But you can imagine now, when I'm sure you've all seen birds attempting to mate with each other. It's really, you know, it looks like an awkward process because this bird uh, will sort of, if, let's pretend this is the male, he would have had to jump on top of the female and somehow her tail has to move out of the way 
and the two openings have to come together for fertilization to take place. And I just think it's the most uh, um, interestingly inconvenient way to have to reproduce. Anyway, it seems to be very effective. More than, what is it, two and a half thousand species of birds worldwide. So clearly mating amongst the birds is not a particularly difficult activity. So that's the first thing. Then, then, <laughs> as Rebecca has just said into my ear, she said, birds do it. And what she means, of course, she's referring to that wonderful song, birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it. Let's do it. Let's fall in love. Wonderful. Now, the other thing we're going to look at quickly in this particular segment is the ears, which I'm not sure I can find. But we often think of the ears of the owl as being there. Those are not the ears. Those are just tufts. The ears are somewhere in here. And what I will do is start to remove the feathers from around this area and see if we can't find the ear opening because the ear opening on owls is supposed to be offset. In other words, the right ear is either higher or lower than the left ear and what that does is allows the bird to judge distance using only its ears. But I can't find it just yet. I'll have to pull these feathers out. I don't want you to have to witness that because it can look a bit grim. I will find the ears somewhere in the skull. Here it is. Here's the ear opening. I think. No, it's not. It's just a join in the skull. But I will find the ear. Oh, maybe that's it. Hang on a second. It's starting to smell a bit ripe, isn't it, Liam? Mm -hmm. there, there we go. There's the ear on the one side. Right. And let's see. That's now just sort of above the eye. Let's see if we can find the one on the other side. And I must just once again say to those of you who are a bit sensitive about things like this, it's just, I know that it's pretty grim, but it's very interesting stuff. Right, there's the other one. It's much bigger. And if you look, I'm going to hold him up now. I'm going to put my fingers in his ears. This is astounding. So there's the right ear where my right f index finger is. And there's the left ear. And you can see the right ear much higher up than the left. Can you see that? I think that's really quite remarkable. <laughs> oh, that's a little peaky. <laughs> um, M. Lewis, you're wondering why this is called an eagle owl and not just an owl. Ach, it's simply because he's huge. They're just the biggest owls and that's why they're called eagle owls. They're not uh, substantially different from the smaller owls. They're, very, they're the same family. They're not related to eagles at all. They're just able. Uh, they've got these huge talons, and so they look a little bit like eagles' talons, and that's why they're called eagle owls. But it's, it's the big ones that are called eagle owls. Now, this foot, there are th three types of foot that an owl or an, a bird can have. The one is with three, point, three toes facing forward and one back. The other is with two back and two forward, and then the other, though the last one, is what this bird has. I think this is what this bird has. In fact, it definitely does. This is a situation where the bird has got the third digit, is able to go forward. You can see that. It looks almost like a, an eagle's claw, or it can go all the way back, and it looks a little bit like a woodpecker's claw now, zygodactyl. And this one can clearly do both. So the third joint uh, can move both ways. But you can see these vicious talons, which would have been used to kill, well, rats and mice and gerbils and other rodents that it would find around here, maybe even something up to the size of a squirrel, and quite possibly the odd reptile. Except, of course, they are nocturnal, and very few reptiles hang about at night, except some of the snakes. Right. I'm going to keep... <laughs> 
my, I'll keep on with my exploration. I'm probably going to get a clothes peg to put over my nose. While I do that, uh, Tristan is still looking.